Hi, everyone. Uh, I think we will start the A-Form School meeting. Sorry about my PowerPoint uh, slides here. Um, I hope you all can see the slides today. Um, today, uh, for the A-Form School 2023, uh, we'll be looking at advances in adaptive radiotherapy. Uh, my name is James and I'm from Singapore. There will be three topics. Uh, the first topic will be current practices and progress in adaptive radiotherapy. Uh, that will be by Professor Jin Song Kim. Uh, the second will be by uh, Professor Song Yong Park, who will be speaking on adaptive RT in proton beam therapy. The third will be uh, Dr. Hong Chi Tan, He'll be uh, speaking on AI and deep learning in adaptive radiotherapy, uh, progress and challenges. Uh, this will be the three speakers uh, for today. Uh, Professor Jin Song Kim from Guangzhou uh, University and uh, Professor Sun Yong Park from National Cancer Center Singapore and the National University of Singapore. And uh, Dr. Hong Chi, uh, Tan Hong Chi. Um, and he's from the National Cancer Center uh, Singapore as well. Uh, I hope uh, all of you are able to listen in. Uh, and uh, if you have any feedback, do let uh, any one of us know. Uh, the first speaker, I will do a quick introduction as well. Uh, uh, Jin Song Kim is currently working as an associate professor at the uh, radiation oncology in radiation oncology at Ron State University College of Medicine. He is a chief medical physicist in the division of medical physics, uh, with over thirty clinical medical physicists, and uh, it is the number one team in Korea and leads the medical physics and bioengineering lab at Yonsei University with more than 15 graduate students. Along with his clinical work, he's conducting uh, various research projects with graduate students. And in addition, he founded a startup called OncoSoft in 2019 and is preparing for the next generation of radiation therapy using AI. And in 1996, uh, uh, Dr. Kim majored in nuclear and quantum engineering at KAIST in Korea where he also began his research on energy. When he started his master's degree in year 2000, he became interested and motivated in medical physics while working as a, research, a researcher at Washington University in St. Louis. He started his career in medical physics uh, through uh, research on computer-aided diagnosis. And after obtaining a PhD from KAIST in 2007, he completed his two-year medical physics residency at the National Cancer Center in Korea with the IBA Proton Machine. He then majored, he then moved uh, to the Samsung Medical Center to set up the Sumitomo Proton Machine and conducted uh, clinical research for seven years. And after moving to Yonsei University, uh, which was preparing the first carbon ion therapy in, in Korea uh, in 2016, he was given the role of leading the current medical physics group. In particular, he believes that image plays a very important role in radiotherapy and cancer therapy. Through his specialized experience in commissioning and operating two proton therapy system and one heavy uh, ion therapy system uh, in a particle uh, therapy field. He has published more than 150 papers. This is achieved through the various research projects he has conducted with his outstanding team in order to lead the role of medical physics in cancer treatment. He is also a member of the Young Korea Academy of Science and Technology in Korea and serves on the board of directors of the Korean Society of Medical Physics, the Korean Society of Radiation Oncology, the Korean Society of Medical um, Artificial Inter Intelligence and the Radiation Defense Society. In addition, he is actively participating in conferences such as PDCOP, AAPM, and ASTRO. Professor Kim, 
is now becoming a world-renowned researcher through collaborative research and activities with various international institutions. And his next steps will continue to make remarkable uh, uh, progress forward for medical physics. So uh, we want to thank uh, Professor Jin Song Kim today, who will be uh, giving us a talk on current practices and progress in adaptive radiotherapy. I shall now hand this time to Professor Kim. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful introduction and thank you for inviting me this opportunity to introduce uh, adaptive uh, radiation therapy at this moment. So as moderator mentioned before, um, so recently my work is for, uh, I mean, carbon ion therapy and the carbon ion therapy is not suitable for adaptive radiation therapy because, I mean, we don't have any 3D volumetric imaging for carbon, but uh, beside of carbon machine in our university, uh, we uh, have 12 uh, Combeam CT based or MV CT based uh, the machine. So, and then we are treating um, over 400 patients per, per day. So I hope my talk and uh, uh, my presentation will give some introduction uh, for today's agenda, adaptive radiation therapy. And I think the second presentation and the third presentation will be most more um, objective and more fun to hear. And uh, I want to yeah start uh, today's presentation. So. I have a small conflict, uh, so but it's not that big. So today's content. Um, so I want to introduce radiation therapy process a little bit, and uh, after that, so I mean to do uh, adaptive radiation therapy, we definitely need um, the volumetric imaging, so image guided guidance. So I will briefly show us. I mean, the IGRT option we have. And uh, I try to give some example for adaptive radiation therapy for, I mean, second and third topic. And um, I mean, there is one interesting paper, um, I mean, the survey uh, for the proton ART. So I, I will show the paper and we can get uh, some insight for radiation, I mean, adaptive radiation therapy, I think. And um, there is some chatting from someone. Basically, can you can hear me, right? There is some word. Yes, I... we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So the first part, um, radiation therapy. I mean, this is some basic, uh, but it's better to. Um, introduced the basic uh, five uh, process. The first one, CT simulation. Second, the contouring for the tumor and normal organ. And third one, the radiation therapy planning uh, using TPS. And the uh, fourth one, uh, the QA, I mean quality assurance for each patient and the chart check. And the five, uh, treatment. I don't know in your hospital how many days to between CT simulation and the treatment, but uh, normally in our hospital, it's longer than seven days. So basically we are not, I mean, uh, the ideal treatment. So ideally the contouring and the planning, the QA, uh, if these three uh, process is possible, for uh, the real time, it will be better for the patient. So yeah, we can see what is controlling and what is planning for this the video. And the first one, CT simulation. So this is a little bit old, the, I mean, classic textbook. So we need to take a uh, CT for uh, our planning and our whole process. Uh, some. Sometimes we use this uh, immobilization device. 
And the second one is target delineation and uh, normal tissue delineation too. So GTV, CTV, PTV, we, I mean, I don't want to exp uh, explain detail, but uh, anyhow, in our process, we definitely need uh, this kind of a process. And uh, normally uh, it will take, I mean, so this is maybe four years ago, uh, I took this video uh, for uh, some breast cancer patient with our resident, fourth, uh, fourth grade resident. So he's doing some drawing, use this kind of uh, the tablet. Yeah, and anyhow, we need this uh, process. And the third one is radiation therapy planning. There are many uh, different the TPS, Eclipse, Legislation, Monaco, etc. But anyhow, we uh, need to, I mean, paint the dose according to, I mean, the prescription and uh, some protocol. So, Here I have a plan. I'm sorry, oops. Where is the slide? Yeah, this is uh, the therapy planning uh, process. The target, I mean, the goal of TPS, I mean, radiation therapy planning to give high dose to tumor and the low dose to normal tissue. So to old, I mean, in order to get that goal, this is a uh, most important, um, I mean, window for our process. I mean, for example, this point at the yellow one is esophagus. So this point means, um, so in step two, we draw, I mean, the esophagus. So after that, we can uh, calculate the esophagus uh, total volume. And uh, among total volume, 27, maybe 27% of esophagus volume is getting the dose uh, 600 centigrade. So we need to take care about this uh, dose volume histogram on uh, each patient uh, radiation therapy planning. And the fourth one uh, will be the QA, quality assurance. So normally we uh, did this kind of measurement of using film or some advanced uh, chamber system. And the final goal is we, we need to compare the treatment planning and the real measurement, and uh, we can get some gamma analysis and whatever they called some comparison between uh, treatment system, uh, I mean, simulation versus measurement. And uh, after checking the, I mean, some threshold, and then we can continue our treatment. And of uh, step five for treatment with verification. So, so far, so many uh, Linux and many, uh, I mean, treatment machine has the volumetric imaging system. Tomotherapy has MVCT or clear RT. I will explain a little bit in detail later. So anyhow, a patient come to a hospital and uh, yeah, he uh, need to lay down in the couch and uh, before Actual treatment, we can get uh, the Combium CT. That means some 3D volumetric imaging. And then we can compare the CT uh, we take in step one, the KBCT in step one, and the uh, MVCT or Combium CT in step five. And then we can compare that two different uh, 3D volumetric CT. And then we can get uh, the difference between the CT and we can uh, I mean, get this difference and we can uh, adjust this number according to uh, the, I mean, with this couch. There is basic uh, workflow in radiation therapy. And uh, right now we are talking about adaptive radiation therapy. So past and present normal um, radiation therapy 
is kind of this work this workflow ct controlling planning q after that several fraction therapy among them we can get another um, ct simulation but normally we didn't uh, take other ct but ideally uh, if we can get ct for a uh, whole process and uh, we can we can deliver the best treatment planning and a dose to patient every day with each basic concept. And uh, it, I mean, in order to that, we need to reduce whole time in uh, the real time. At this moment, I mentioned before, step two, three, uh, four uh, is taking, I mean, over seven days normally. But nowadays, maybe the other speaker will talk about AI. Uh, approach for this adaptive realization therapy. So they will give some freedom to give this kind of activity in in an hour at this moment. But hopefully in five years later, you can deliver this adaptive realization therapy within a minute, hopefully. So this is another the graph uh, from Physical Medical Journal. It's a treatment each fraction using uh, this kind of uh, CombiMCT, CT, MVCT, MRI. I will show you later this kind of machines. And uh, we can uh, repeat, repeatedly uh, the plan for each uh, I mean, simulation, CT, CombiMCT, MVCT, MR. And uh, finally, we can deliver the best um, dose for each patient in each fraction. So second part, uh, IGRT, I mean, imaging option we have. The first one, so long time ago, but sadly, I mean, in carbon therapy we have, so we have only have 2D X-ray imaging. So CyberKnife doesn't have any Combeam. Yeah, they using they are using this kind of two oblique X-ray system and the uh, carbon, although in our hospital, we have a carbon gantry, but unfortunately, we don't have a combium CT at, the, at this moment. We just are using this to the X-ray. So best way we can deliver, I mean, most, uh, I mean, most exact dose to the patient is kind of this kind of, uh, I mean, fluoroscopic imaging. We can uh, give, so optimize optimized I mean, dose to the patient, but it's not uh, really planned for uh, each patient. So to do that kind of stuff, uh, we definitely need some uh, 3D imaging. So basically, so many uh, Linux have Combium CT. This is Electa, this is the variant. So, yeah, so historically, I mean, the Electa uh, are giving 4D Combium CT be uh, before the variant, but anyhow, this is their uh, Combium CT image quality at this moment. So we can compare Combium CT and the 4D CT if you want. And uh, recently, uh, Netherlands group, uh, they are basically, um, I mean, he, they makers, yeah, he uh, visited our hospital yesterday. He actually, he is godfather of Unity, and uh, but they have 11, uh, I mean, electric machine, and uh, they deliver you know, online adaptive RT uh, with electric compatibility, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, two years ago, one year ago, yeah. So this is Plenty City and the online Combium CT with adaptive control. And uh, Electa can give uh, intrafractional Combium CT. And uh, at this moment, this is not uh, applicable for any adaptive radiation therapy, but hopefully in the near future, we can use this uh, Combium CT, I mean, intrafraction Combium CT for some, I mean, adaptive radiation therapy. Yeah. And this is another machine, the variant machine. So Combium CT image quality has been, I mean, improved 
using the Hei Suyun. And this is originally step ones at the plane CT. And this is, uh, I mean, original Combeam CT. And the third one is iterative global dash Combeam CT. Yeah, this is another slide. Yeah, I mean, the previous one is liver. And this one is prostate and uh, some GU site. And the uh, variant give another, uh, I mean, advanced of Combeam CT using hypocyte. So basically, uh, CT and hypocyte combi CT. I mean, they are saying they don't have any big difference according to the house field unit. So we can use this one for additive relation setup easily. So this is uh, their, I mean, advertisement slide. So this is a step one uh, CT and then the this is the step five, the Combeam CT at the treatment machine. So although they have some artifact over there, but roughly uh, we can use this one for treatment planning. And this is head and neck, Kate, I mean, the slide. And uh, I mean, recently, um, I mean, Berian uh, gave this ETO2 system, Combeam CT based adaptive uh, radiation RT. And um, they can, they are saying uh, online adaptive step in 15 minutes. So, I mean, Combeam CT acquisition within uh, 17 seconds, segmentation within one, mil um, one minute, and plan generation. And uh, yeah, two minute uh, and the QA and delivery. But so unfortunately, in our hospital, we don't have a ETOS system. So it's not easy to say this one is true or not. But uh, important point is, I mean, focus. I mean, the important thing is, I mean, the, the variant and the Electa is doing something for uh, adaptive radiation therapy at this moment. And hopefully we can give this kind of technique uh, in near future more frequently and more uh, freely. And uh, this is what uh, they, they are saying. It's a very ethosis system. And uh, this is another uh, bender, um, Okuri, and uh, they Attach it, uh, the big, uh, the, the planning, I mean, black panel detector for the KB, KB uh, CT. And uh, this is step one, the planning CT. And uh, this is uh, the clear RT system. So basically they are, they look very same. And uh, yesterday we have some symposium and uh, the user of clear RT, they really satisfy this clear RT image quality. So, I mean, this kind of image quality, we can use this clear RT for uh, adaptive radiation therapy. So basically we can draw CTV, PTV based on this image quality. And uh, they are doing some offline adaptive solution and uh, finally, maybe next year, they uh, they will offer some online adaptive uh, radiation therapy solution in some meeting. And uh, yeah, after that, the Combeam CT was popular. And uh, from, so yesterday, the lay maker visited our hospital and I realized that, I mean, Electa and uh, UMC, Utrecht, they tried to make this, uh, I mean, Unity system from 1999. So this is over two, 24 years. So anyhow, at this moment, Bure was gone. So Electa Unity is only one system can deliver actually uh, with the MRI system. So basically they have seven megavoltage FF, F X-ray uh, with 1.5 Tesla Philips MR. And the good thing is you can easily see uh, the soft tissue uh, during the treatment. So this is Ingenia, I mean, Philips 1.5, uh, I mean, Philips uh, MR system. Yeah, and uh, you can see the prostate and the other soft tissue. 
it's totally different with the uh, Combeam CT and the KB CT. And uh, another the advantage of MR for brain. So they, uh, I mean, Electa Unity, yeah, we, we have two systems, ATP and ATPS. So ATP is adapt to position and uh, the most uh, difficult one is adapt to shape. So this one, we need to do re-optimization for the best plan and the adaptive position just change to aperture shape. So basically, the Electa Unity offer this kind of adaptation process for the patient at this moment. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of ATP ATS comparison, but I want to explain in detail at this moment. So this is image quality. So definitely we can see the difference between CT and MR. So, so basically, I mean, this one is a CT simulation and uh, this one, the middle one is MR imaging before treatment. So there is big difference, all right? So this one is saying, we definitely need adaptive radiation therapy for our patient, maybe daily basis. But uh, at this moment, that is not possible, but hopefully, we can give this adaptive radiation therapy in your future for our patient. Now, this is another slide. Uh, this one is a little bit better. CT, we can see the target, MR, almost the same position, right? But uh, yeah, and uh, this one is some breast case. Uh, CT and MR looks similar, but a little bit different. An important point is, I mean, this one is breast case in our hospital, at Gangnam Severance Hospital. You can see the movement of opting nerve. I mean, before, before this case, we don't, I mean, we believe opting nerve is not moving, but you can see, I mean, opting nerve is moving like this one. So if you, see this kind of a movement for, uh, I mean, your, I mean, OAR, you definitely uh, think on uh, adaptive radiation therapy. Uh, this is another example. I mean, this is a little bit, speed is a little bit problem, but yeah, we are moving. Sorry. So, yeah, last year, finally, Electa uh, Unity uh, motion management for the, I mean, the gating and the tracking system they are trying to do. Yeah, they already treat uh, to the patient with their system. So you can see their movement and uh, we can, I mean, Electa system can tracking the tumor and OAR. And uh, right now they are trying to get I mean, clearance and uh, they want to expand this program in the near future. Yeah, and uh, this is a letter program. And um, so they, I mean, basically they uh, can get basic MR for anatomy. And uh, they, 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 they are trying to uh, give more biological uh, I mean, guided radiation therapy using MR. So one of the example is DWM, diffusion weighted imaging for their tumor. So they found this one and they can give more uh, high dose according to this technique. And hopefully we can use this one in near future too. And finally, uh, other X-ray system using the PET, the reflection. This is not uh, possible for um, Asia at this moment. I, I believe they are trying to get FDA. And uh, I heard that uh, I mean, in United States, they already start the treatment. But anyhow, the system is looks like they have a 6MV uh, Linux. And uh, they have 
Oh, yeah, 16 slice fembin combin. Uh, I mean, cable a uh, cable tails the CT the fembin CT, and that they have a pad, so they can. Oh, I mean, they can get uh, F I P pad imaging during treatment. So according to that imaging, they can give the more uh, dose to the tumor. So this is their plan. And hopefully we can uh, get more information about this one. And um, so until now, I explained at the X-ray machine with uh, some volumetric imaging. And uh, Proton will be presented in the next speakers, I believe. And uh, I bring some adaptive radiation therapy process. And uh, this one is most, I mean, recommendation, most good I mean, recommendation paper, adaptive ART strategy and technical consideration from Red Journal. So they are, uh, this paper is, I um, mean, divide online adaptive and offline adaptive. And um, they mentioned, I mean, as I mentioned before, we have a CT and the Combim CT, MV CT, MR, PET imaging. They, they all has, I mean, pros and cons. And you can decide, decide to go which system you want uh, in your hospital. And that this is current, I mean, summary of, I mean, image registration program, because I mean, in our process number, uh, I mean, second step, the contouring is most painful process at this moment. And another problem is treatment planning. So this paper is a little bit uh, old one, maybe two years ago. So we need to update the vendor, but anyhow, uh, you need to consider the the program software. And now uh, this is the minimum requirement to consider ART workflow component. So it's not easy to explain in uh, 40 minutes, uh, I mean, in 10 minutes in for this one, but you can uh, read this paper and you can get an insight. And uh, basically ART component for imaging we definitely need a uh, house, house field unit uh, accuracy and the geometry accuracy and this kind of the I mean, element and the criteria. And you can, we, you need to check uh, before uh, set up uh, your ART program in your hospital. Yeah, and this is another uh, the recommendation for uh, the the staff, a therapist, dosimetrist, uh, physicist, and physician. And hopefully this one is a good guidance for you in the future. So I will I bring some actual, I mean, on, online adaptive uh, planning workflow using some ML. Uh, so basically, we definitely uh, proceed to the number one process, CT, and uh, I mean planning, and uh, after that we uh, can get volumetric image of the day uh, of the treatment. Combine uh, CT. I'm sorry. Do you have any question? Maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely we need volumetric imaging of the day for adaptive radiation therapy. And after that, you can try rigid or deformable registration or I mean, between two imaging. The first one, the KVCT of CT simulation. And the second one is volumetric imaging of the day. So after that kind of uh, registration, you can continue uh, to draw contour and the electron density mapping. So we definitely need to check uh, the household unit or uh, this kind of electron density mapping according to your system. If you have a combined CT, you need to take care of uh, this matching. 
and um, Emma, you 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 need to think about how can you, yeah, handle with this Emma to combine. I mean, Hounsfield unit synthetic CT is another way or other assumption is I mean, which is done by Unity manual density assignment. After that, um, MD control edit. Uh, I mean, this kind of edit we need for each the, the day of fraction. And after um, editing uh, the contouring, so those prediction. So basically we can use the, I mean, the basic uh, planning parameter from the first treatment or whatever they want. We can give those prediction after that. Yeah, we uh, we can give another re optimization for uh, I mean the, for the imaging of the day. After that, plan normalization and the evaluation and the independent plan evaluation. I mean, it's not easy to measure actual uh, treatment planning result, so. Uh, at least independent plan check the Monte Carlo calculation or whatever you want. Yeah, it's better to each each this definitely necessary for the patient safety. So after that, uh, we can give uh, adaptive dose to the patient. Yeah, this is a survey from proton adaptive radiation therapy, but you can get some insight uh, for the future. You can check this paper, a survey from practice pattern for adaptive particle therapy for interfractional change. And uh, this is uh, the abstract. The seven, 70 center are, I mean, responsible for this uh, survey. And the final uh, result uh, is ATP adaptive particle therapy was mostly done offline at this moment. And uh, yeah, 68% of user has planned to increase their use for ART. And the main barrier is the lack of integrity efficient workflow. I will show you later. So basically this is the table for the participant, 68 clinical responders. Uh, and the uh, bladder cervix in the prostate, head and neck. So majority is I mean, head and neck and lung and the prostate, etc. cetera. And uh, this is uh, the lesion for the plant adaptation. First one, the blue one is a visual inspection and the uh, red one is a doji evaluation. So the doji evaluation lead I mean, plant adaptation at this moment. And now uh, this is level of automation in the each workflow. So basically, a blue one is a fully automatic, automatically uh, work process, but uh, nothing happened uh, one hundred percent. So the pre is pretty, pretty, pretty automatically checked, but majority is semi automatically or still manually or proton ART. And this is uh, yeah, QA for ART. The majority led one is pre-treatment measurement. And uh, there is a few secondary dose calculation, right? Yeah, and uh, some center are using logo file analysis. And this is more and most important uh, the graph, I think. So, so they uh, check uh, each component to improve ART for existing treatment site. What is more important? So they think the sixth, I mean, 68 responder think the most important thing is integration and workflow. And uh, this one, uh, limited human resource and the concern about accuracy of those accumulation. So we need to think about this kind of yeah aspect in 
our uh, protocol and uh, your hospital and the limited equipment means there is a few, I mean, convivity for uh, the proton. So, and uh, they, they don't think this kind of data connectivity and the dose calculation speed and uh, this one is not, I mean, main hurdle for their I mean, ART process. And uh, this is another uh, the bottleneck for, I mean, for new treatment site. The previous one is for existing treatment site, and this one is new treatment site, but almost the same, the lack of integration and the human resource. So we need to think about this kind of uh, our current status. And uh, this is a vision of action of that paper. Uh, PC means partially uh, consensus and uh, FC means full uh, consensus. So they think uh, in single room imaging modality will, yeah, in 10 years. So locally we can say in 10 years, ART will be popular and uh, we need to give this adaptive radiation therapy for each patient, that basic the vision and uh, to do that kind of aspect, we definitely need imaging and the software integration, workflow and controlling and planning this kind of we need. So summary. So I bring the summary of uh, from this paper. So overall, although I mean, resource intensive ART show incredible promise for offering the gain in OER sparing and improving target coverage. Yeah, as vendors, as I mentioned before, many vendors offer I mean, imaging system and the ART process. And uh, it, that kind of vendor offering increase and our ability to perform workflow within standard clinical operation become easier and the ART more routinely when clinically indicated is rapidly expanding. Yeah, I think I spent yeah, 45 minutes. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, it's been a very good talk. And uh, thank you for the nice uh, overall summary of the of elective radiotherapy. It's uh, very informative for everyone. Uh, there's one question from the uh, from one of our audience. Uh, do you think uh, CBCT and MR imaging go together or someday MR will replace all CBCT in the future? What is your opinion? Um, good question. Uh, thank you for good question. I think um, so problem, I mean, practical problem is the price of machines. Mm -hmm. So, I believe for, for soft tissue, MR is superior than uh, Combium CT. That's, I mean, that's a fact. And uh, we can deny that kind of uh, fact. So, but uh, it's not easy to get Unity or other MR-based system for every uh, patient because a little bit expensive than Combium CT Linux. Mm -hmm. So, I think majority patient uh, will be uh, delivered using Combium CT and uh, some soft tissue patient, we can use uh, Unity. I, I, I think that's clinical and the practical the way to select machine in hospital too. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? I have one more question for you, uh, yep. Professor Kim. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, a system like Ethos uses uh, AI segmentation. Uh, do you think, uh, because uh, one of the key issue of uh, ART is efficiency, do you think that AI planning has a role to play in the future? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, AI controlling is getting popular at this moment. And uh, hopefully AI planning will be the same because, I mean, adaptation has a little bit different aspect because, I mean, normally AI give, I mean, we will, I mean, AI model that is kind of uh, the general model. But our adaptive radiation therapy is kind of a patient specific uh, model. So if we have some prior and prior uh, I mean plan, and the e it's more easier to give AI predict uh, those. So in near future, we can get some AI uh, the planning uh, soon for our workflow. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Yes, another question. Can you compare the dosimetric parameters between adaptive contours and manual contours? Is it reliable? Yeah. So basically, uh, definitely this is yeah uh, possible uh, when you do adaptive uh, process. They have, I mean, the manual, they have, I mean, we can give manual control or adaptive control. So basically we need to check the difference between uh, these two uh, control. But after some comparison, it's better to believe which one is better for yeah. your workflow. <laughs> yes. Right, thank you very much. Another yep. question is regarding flash technology. If a uh, flash technology becomes a reality in the future, is ART still necessary? Uh, it's another good question, I think. Um, so today I didn't mention about uh, some new adaptive radiation therapy concept, PERSA. Uh, I mean, uh, so flash is kind of give one shot, right? One single shot for, I mean, during very small, I mean, short time. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we definitely give a need to give another shot for the patient too. In the process, yeah, ART is still, part, I mean, necessary. And the other point is if ART is possible in real time, we can also deliver flesh in real time. So ART okay. is kind of, the basic uh, radiation therapy workflow for every patient. Hmm. Okay, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question as well. And I think, uh, thank you very much for uh, replying to these questions. I'm sure you know we can benefit a lot more from your input. We will uh, like to thank you very much for your thank nice you. uh, talk. And I will go ahead and present the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Kim. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So, um, uh, Professor uh, Kim has uh, concluded his talk. We will move to our second speaker, Professor Song Yong Park. Uh, currently, uh, Song Yong Park is the Chief Proton Physicist at National Cancer Center Singapore, and he's also a professor at the National University of Singapore. He has over 30 years of clinical working experience from several institutions and has held the chief position in two institutions for, for over 18 years. And during his uh, career, he has been involved in setting up programs at two new uh, radiation oncology departments, including proton therapy, IMRT, IGRT, HDR, tomotherapy, uh, S and SRS, uh, SRT and has been instrumental in uh, the selection, commissioning, acceptance, and training of staff. In particular, he implemented the launch of the National Cancer Center Proton Therapy Program in Korea and worked for the McLaren Proton Therapy Project in the US. In addition, he has established the first medical physics resident and fellowship program at National Cancer Center in Korea. 
His research experience and expertise in the field has led to his involvement with several prestigious scientific groups, including membership in IECTC 62C Working Party on Light Ion Therapy, KAPM Task Group Number 199, and the Task Group Number 224, and more. He has uh, published more than 126 research articles and given more than 83 invited talks. He has also received several research grants and patents. His current research interests include uh, range uncertainties in proton therapy, automation of quality insurance, proton imaging, and proton therapy dosimetry. So we are happy to have with us uh, Professor Song Yong Park today, who will uh, give us a talk on adaptive RT in proton beam therapy. I'll hand this time to uh, Professor Park. Professor Park, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor James, for your nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And uh, it's my great honor to give a talk at this time. Let me share my screen first. Okay. Hope for everyone to see my screen. Okay, I have uh, nothing to disclose. Okay, here are the learning objectives for today. Uh, First, uh, what is a re adaptive radiation therapy? And what is the rationale for adaptation in uh, proton therapy? And what should be considered for ART in proton therapy? And whether online or offline ad adaptive radiation therapy in proton therapy? Okay, so uh, what is the adaptive radiation therapy? Uh, according to uh, Dian from uh, William Bowman Hospital in US, and uh, it is a closed loop radiation treatment process where the treatment uh, plan can be modified using a systematic feedback of measurement with the intention to improve radiation treatment by systematically monitoring treatment variations and incorporating them to re-optimize the treatment plan early on during the course of treatment. So while I was making this presentation slides, and then I uh, simply uh, Google search in PubMed, uh, typing adaptive radiation therapy. Surprisingly, there are over 11,000 uh, papers are searched. So there are a lot of, lot of papers are uh, uh, available. Okay, so this slide shows how the radiation therapy technology has been developed from 3, 2D uh, radiation therapy to 3D conformal radiation therapy. And after that, IMRT and VMAT, followed by uh, image-guided radiation therapy and particle therapy to provide a steep dose gradient. And nowadays, it's ART. As the new technology has been uh, introduced, the reduction of normal tissue dose has been expected. Okay, so here's a simple uh, study we have performed years ago for cranial spinal irradiation using 3D conformal radiation therapy and tomotherapy and proton therapy. So regardless of what uh, X-ray treatment therapy you use, uh, you still deliver a certain amount of radiation dose to the healthy organ. But whereas for proton therapy, the proton beam stops at the end of the beam range, there's no uh, dose to the healthy organ. However, uh, range uncertainties in proton therapy are the biggest challenge and can be substantial. So here's an example where if we introduce uh, uh, increased density on the impact of a photon beam, you may disturb uh, or reduce the intensity uh, attenuation by uh, two to three percent. If you do the same manner to the proton therapy, you may uh, miss the target. So that's where the range of uncertainties in proton therapy are the biggest challenges and can be substantial. So when do we need uh, uh, adaptive therapy? Well, uh, geometrical changes can occur in patients between treatment fractions, while random uh, uncertainties are typically managed with the margins around the target volume, unexpected anatomical changes can pose challenges. Okay, so here's an example where uh, we see on daily uh, clinical cases that we see the patient weight loss in the neck region during the head and neck irradiation. And we also see the variable filling of the nasal cavity here. 
So it will make uh, the photon beam range different. And also the tumor shrinkage in the lung during the radiation therapy. These are all effect impact for the proton beam range. Ultimately, it will change the isodose distribution. So the primary goal of adaptive radiation therapy is to ensure the precise delivery of the prescribed radiation dose while maintaining constraints for healthy tissue. Okay, again, it is a, a cross group process as uh, that uh, systematically monitors treatment variation and incorporate them into treatment plan optimization. So this approach aims to enhance treatment effectiveness. Uh, ART also can reduce the margins uh, as compared to traditional approaches, improving uh, treatment uh, accuracy. Uh, implementing plant adaptation faces challenges related to clinical workflow and variable resources. It involves steps such as imaging, uh, contour definition, plant evaluation, and plant adaptation and plant verification. And how often we need to do uh, adaptation? Uh, well, it varies from the fixed interval to on-demand based on observed changes. Imaging quality and resource availability influence the uh, uh, adaptation uh, frequency. So adaptive therapy can follow uh, various strategies, both offline and online. Offline uh, adaptation often involves image analysis and replaning. Uh, basically, you know, in most cases, typically we have done in a way we have, we've been doing uh, offline adaptation, while uh, online adaptation aims for real time adjustment. Online adaptation poses a uh, computational challenges with the need of rapid image registration, optimization, and dose calculation. I will talk about this in more detail. Too much shrinkage and changes in patient anatomy can complicate the process. Okay, another thing we need to consider is the dosimetry correction uh, based on uh, daily imaging or critical aspect of adaptive therapy, allowing for adjustment to the treatment plan to maintain treatment goals. The criteria for plan adaptation need to be also defined, striking a balance between treatment outcome and the added planning and delivery effort. So thresholds are typically based on dosimetry criteria. So there are site-specific adaptation. Uh, the need for adaptation depends on the treatment site, and the study has shown the benefit of various cancer types, including head and neck and prostate and lung cancer. And having done this, uh, so we need to perform those verification. And adaptive strategies often include those verification or daily dose reconstruction based on delivery information, which can help make those symmetry corrections in subsequent fractions. So those symmetry characteristics of proton therapy plans might require different adaptive strategies, highlighting the need for ongoing research and development. So this is a typical workflow for ad online adaptive therapy with the uh, in-room CT. So from a uh, pre-treatment stage, you generate a plan from a reference 3D imaging. On daily process using um, in in-room CT uh, to compare the imaging in between and then do ultra fast re-optimization for those calculations and to uh, deliver the uh, treatment Team to the uh, to the patient, and from there you're using the log file and reconstruct the ion of uh, delivery dose to back to uh, to that calculate accumulated dose to make sure that uh, what dose will be uh, expected for this particular patient. Okay, now let's talk about a little bit more on rationale for uh, plant adaptation. Okay, so proton therapy has led to marked advances in treatment, mainly because of its excellent dose distribution, resulting from a well-localized energy deposition at the end of the beam path, so-called black pit. However, uh, proton therapy is more sensitive to uncertainty in treatment planning and beam delivery as compared to X-ray therapy. 
in this recent day, uh, scanning beam uh, systems offer increased flexibility because we don't use uh, apertures and uh, compensator. So this allows us for rapid changes in treatment uh, delivery. So this adaptability is particularly useful for online adaptive therapy workflow where the adjustment can be made during the course of treatment based on the observed changes in the patient anatomy or other factors. Now, uh, let's talk about the range uncertainty. Where's coming from and how can we uh, reduce the range uncertainty? The precision of the Bragg peak, where the majority of uh, physical dose deposition occurs in proton therapy is subject to uncertainty. Uh, there are a number of sources of range uncertainties in proton therapy. Uh, first is coming from the CT imaging uncertainties. Uh, typically, it's a range of 3.5%. And those calculation uncertainties and treatment delivery uncertainties and patient anatomy uncertainties. A uh, range of CT imaging uncertainties. Uh, we can reduce by applying uh, stoichiometric calibration and dual energy CT imaging can help uh, reduce systematic range uncertainty. Uh, potentially, uh, if you can introduce a proton CT, you will re uh, remove this inherent uh, CT uncertainty. Okay, uh, what about the impact of uh, patient anatomy and setup changes? Okay, it can be varied effect on range uncertainties uh, based on treatment sites and technique. Uh, daily variations in patient setup or anatomy can impact on proton range and affecting the dose, the target of surrounding organ. Setup uncertainties across uh, treatment site setup. Uh, in this case, setup uncertainties and immobilization can vary for different patient uh, populations. So there are a couple of studies on uh, head and neck cases. So head and neck patient uh, population experience setup and anatomic variations uh, during the treatment. Uh, currently, we are treating uh, many uh, NPC cases in our clinic. We see on daily a uh, variation of neck position and the patient weight loss and uh, some anatomical changes. Uh, this we see every day. So even uh, small changes of neck position will make a huge difference of uh, patient treatment uh, outcome. So this is very, very important for proton therapy. So patient weight loss and setup uncertainties can equally impact uh, range uncertainty. Uh, what about prostate treatment? Uh, prostate movement within the patient depends on the factors like bladder filling, uh, rectal motion, and patient setup. Uh, range uncertainties in prostate treatment depend on the surrounding tissues and can be influenced by the motion of the prostate over different time periods. And also, uh, in the case of uh, prostate treatment using uh, proton therapy, typically we uh, use uh, two bilateral beams where the beams are hitting to uh, uh, femoral head. So femoral head position also change the range of the proton beams. So that should be also uh, accurately uh, address for your uh, imaging position. Okay, what about the lung treatment? Uh, proton therapy for lung treatment uh, involves consideration of a target motion. Uh, range uncertainties in lung treatment depends on the location and size of the target, as well as the treatment beam angle. Motion and density differences between target and surrounding tissue contribute to varying magnitude of range uncertainty. So here is an example for organ motion in proton therapy. As you can see here, where depends on the uh, breathing pattern, you see the, uh, the range can be uh, significantly changing, will impact also those, those uh, distribution can be also changed. Okay, uh, what about the margin? So margins are used to account for those uncertainties reducing the uh, risk of missing the target uh, treatment volume due to uh, setup and range uncertainty. Uh, margins are based on the sum of range uncertainties for specific beam angles and may consider a local tissue density variation. So proton therapy plans often uh, apply margins in a beam by beam, design or convert range margins into beam specific PTB. And several studies have explored the beam angle optimization as a metric to reduce range uncertainties and the required margins for target coverage. 
So it can involve considerations of uh, local tissue density variation. So here are some clinical examples for head and neck case. Uh, they have, uh, have, have uh, uh, different treatment volumes with varied changes, such as weight loss affecting neck nodal treatment volume and sinus filling affecting oral pharyngeal treatment volume and daily shoulder positions impacting a low neck node. Uh, in case of proto, uh, prostate, uh, prostate positioning and deformation can vary uh, between the primary gland and seminal vesicles with a potential uh, rotational changes. Okay, uh, now uh, let's move on uh, robust optimization. And while margins have traditionally addressed uncertainties in proton therapy, uh, robust optimization is suggested as an alternative to balance uh, target coverages and OAR avoidance. Uh, robust planning uh, considers uh, uncertainty models uh, during optimization, accommodating most scenarios within the uh, uncertainty boundaries of the considerable effect. So uh, uh, uncertainties considered include those calculations and imaging and biological effect and patient setup uh, and then tumor interfractional uh, movement and beam angle selection. And also a robust plan result in a less sharp dose gradient and region of high dose gradient around the target, aiming to increase the probability of achieving prescribed dose to the target or, or OAR. So there is always a trade-off to make your uh, target coverage versus your OAR uh, state. The primary advantage of robust planning is to determine the optimal trade-off between target dose coverage and OAR sparing. Okay, and uh, recent studies propose uh, geometrical and anatomical robust optimization to account for setup variations with the repeat CT and sinus filling with the synthetic CTs and increasing optimizer robustness to uh, patient-specific uh, anatomical variation. Okay, uh, anatomical variations during treatment, uh, such as gas bubbles, uh, bladder filling, uh, weight loss, uh, uterus position, and pose uh, challenges for robust planning due to complexity of a potential uh, scenario. So in this case, failure to maintain plan robustness uh, may necessitate adaptation during treatment uh, fractionation. So in other words, robust optimization cannot uh, resolve all the issues. So in this case, uh, it may need uh, a plan adaptation or uh, daily adaptation is uh, necessary. So the need for adaptation can be reduced by including more scenarios in the certainty distributions used for robust planning. However, if you include uh, more scenarios for robust optimization, your uh, uh, dose gradients will be very soft, meaning that you have we have uh, so many. Uh, you have actually uh, less coverage. So in this case, uh, plan adaptation is highly re recommended. Okay, so the trade-off between OAR dose and the tumor control, tumor control probability is known as the price of robustness. It's considered in the context of uncertainty distributions and softer dose gradient. Okay, so uh, creating plan libraries with individual plans for each uncertainty scenario may uh, provide a solution to the trade-off, removing the need for softer uh, dose gradient. So given patient-specific uh, uncertainties, uh, robust optimization might be in insufficient, as I mentioned, so leading to the recommendation of a daily or weekly adaptation uh, uh, therapy is, in, is needed in some cases. Okay, so moving forward to adaptation. So uh, both margins and robust optimization increase the dose to surrounding organs to achieve a uh, high confidence in tumor control probability and necessitating uh, daily dose analysis and access to daily optimized plans. Uh, daily adaptive plans could potentially reduce the need for wide margins or uncertainty with, uh, in robust optimization specifically addressing uh, intrafractional variations of a patient anatomy. 
And the early spot intensive reoptimization has shown superior target coverage and lower doses to OAR compared to robust optimization uh, method. Uh, daily adaptive uh, uh, proton therapy is particularly beneficial for sites with a pronounced interfractional variation where critical OARs are in close uh, proximity to a tumor. So there are a couple of examples in case of prostate and head and neck and non-small cell lung cancer out of sites where margin reductions and planning adaptation have shown the most impact on proton therapy. As Professor Lee mentioned that, uh, Professor Kim mentioned that uh, mr uh, studies have demonstrated a significant target position variation uh, requiring uh, validation of current imaging options or additional imaging for adaptive proton therapy for additional uh, treatment sites. So currently, uh, MR uh, proton therapy uh, system has been, uh, is being developed in Dresden in uh, Germany. So hopefully maybe in the next 10 years, you will see the MR uh, proton therapy in the market. Okay, so uh, adaptive proton workflow may have reduced the benefit for sites with little changes over the treatment course. So for instance, uh, if you have a very precise immobilization for brain target and large motion with uh, uh, motion uh, during beam delivery, such as lung, liver, pancreas case. So in this case, uh, adaptive proton therapy workflow may not really help much. Uh, daily adaptive proton therapy uh, provides the clinicians with a greater uh, fl flexibility for those prescriptions allowing for a more conformal dose distributions or redu reduced uh, margin with the potential to alter daily tumor or OAR doses uh, ba uh, based on uh, daily imaging. So clinicians may consider daily dose constraints instead of those uh, instead of constraint based on the entire treatment course, offering opportunities for dose adjustment based on the evolving uh, tumor and OAR geometry. Okay, so now, so there's a more important uh, uh, part for imaging. Okay, so currently uh, CT, uh, let's first talk about the CT first. And in-room imaging is utilized for plan adaptation through either a plan of the day approach or by the planning. And proton and ion therapy centers with a volumetric imaging systems commonly use either CT or combeam CT. And traditional CT systems at uh, proton therapy centers are often large and lack of isocentric imaging uh, due to space requirement. And some early systems, such as those developed at the PSI in Switzerland and NIRS in Japan, employed uh, innovative approaches like a patient docking table or horizontal CT lowered uh, around the uh, uh, seated patient. So in-room CT offers practical advantage over CBCT for adaptive therapy, including better Hunsford unit accuracy, improved image contrast, and the 4D scanning uh, capability. However, uh, challenges associated with in-room CT include the requirement for large treatment room and the need to movement the uh, patient between imaging and uh, treatment position. So a patient uh, may move between the imaging and treatment position. So the gap between the imaging and beam on time increases the risk of patient movement prior to uh, patient, the treatment phase. And although the supplemental measures such as we can use for uh, uh, surface guide imaging system or another X-ray uh, radiography to verify the position. Okay, alternatively, uh, most of centers currently using uh, Combeam CT, where we also using uh, Combeam CT for our patient treatment verif uh, ver uh, verification. Uh, Combeam CT systems for proton therapy can be gantry mounted, uh, nozzle mounted, and room mounted, and couch mounted. Uh, field of view and Hunsfield number accuracy are critical characteristics affecting the utility of uh, CBCT systems for plan adaptation. So this is uh, really a critical part for HU uh, number accuracy for COMBIM CT, so that uh, ultimately uh, proton dose calculation will be uh, quite uh, 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 challenging. 
uh, CBCT-based dose calculation is considered acceptable for photon uh, adaptive therapy and is commercially available with a good accuracy. But however, uh, those calculations in CBCT and proton therapy is still in a research topic. So this slide shows a typical uh, imaging system in a proton therapy uh, community where this uh, uh, gantry mounted in here and this is mounted here and two X-ray panel with the two spray panel detectors. And here's a case for in-room CT and uh, uh, another combined CT on the couch mounted, which will make a, a system very compact. Okay, MRI, as I mentioned, is currently MRI uh, with the uh, uh, proton therapy system is being developed in uh, Germany. Uh, MRI is widely used for online adaptation in photon therapy. However, it's not the case in proton therapy. Uh, challenges include perturbation of dose uh, due to the magnetic field, effect of magnets on image quality and dose calculation on MRI and overall system integration. Uh, so Monte Carlo modeling is uh, effective in understanding and predicting dose perturbation uh, caused by the magnetic field. Uh, lateral deflection of a proton beam decreases, increases with the beam energy and magnetic field strength. Accurate modeling uh, requires knowledge of the magnetic field in the both uh, the imaging field and the fringe field. Okay, so what other imaging technique you can use uh, for uh, in vivo range uh, imaging? Uh, so range verification uh, is crucial for producing uh, high quality adaptive plants in proton therapy. Uh, and currently, uh, we can use uh, proton radiography and positron imaging and prompt gamma imaging. So proton radiography uses a uh, high energy proton beam to measure the energy loss when protons travel on the object. So it can be uh, done in uh, 2D imaging or tomography reconstruction. However, the challenges include low dose rate, uh, but accurate tracking of individual protons are possible. Uh, detectors uh, such as scintillators and gem uh, chambers and solid state devices are used to measure uh, the page and position and residual energy. And alternative approaches, including uh, using uh, uh, energy modulated broad beam, but requires high uh, pa patient dose. Uh, in proton therapy, multiple Coulomb scattering is always an issue, so it, but it can be mitigated using deconvolution or most likely path approaches. And the other method we can use for uh, range imaging is positron imaging. Uh, can measure uh, radioactive uh, positron decay from short life isotopes uh, produced during the therapy. Oxygen 15 and C11 isotopes are of interest with a PET imaging uh, using for offline and online adaptation operation. And also the challenges including correlation between uh, dose and limited resolution and biological washia. And finally, uh, pumped gamma rays uh, can be used, uh, which where they are emitted from the nuclei excited during inelastic uh, scattering event, providing uh, information on those range. So this is a typical uh, setup for a pumped gamma ray measurement, where the proton range can be determined by counting the gamma uh, emitted from the 90 degree of the beam direction. As you can see here, there's an excellent agreement uh, between the ion chamber and prompt gamma ray uh, uh, measurement. Alternative strategies, including uh, time energy reserved prompt gamma, uh, spectroscopy, uh, timing measurement, and Compton camera. Uh, Monte Carlo is used for expected emission pattern uh, computation, uh, providing some millimeter spatial accuracy of depth information. Okay, now let's talk about a little bit on uh, online adaptive uh, strategies. Okay, so there are a couple of a number of challenges we can consider. Uh, imaging for adaptive therapy. Uh, so CT and CBCT are commonly used for adaptive therapy in proton therapy, but the potential of MRI with the higher soft tissue contrast is acknowledged. Uh, techniques exist to substitute CTs with MRI for photon dose calculation. And uh, what about the image registration? Uh, image registration can be done with a, a deformable image registry or a synthetic image registration uh, with AI also. 
And hospital unit uh, differences between the planning CT and omnibus CT can lead to dosimetric discrepancy. And histogram uh, matching algorithms are used to normalize uh, distributions for proton dose calculation. Uh, defining controls accurately is also crucial but challenging, especially for target volume with a low control. Again, so imaging is an issue. Okay, uh, then online adaptation workflows may require an automatic uh, image registration for control definition. Okay, and adaptive workflows use uh, either rigid or deformable registration for control adaptation. Uh, deep learning uh, approaches are explored for control uh, propagation in proton therapy for uh, prostate ca cancer. And controlling uncertainties are more complex uh, to analyze than imaging uncertainties. So Gaussian uncertainty uh, profiles results from imaging errors while plans are consistent with the controlling errors. Uh, probabilistic uh, control definitions are explored to address uh, controlling uncertainty. Okay, then uh, having done this, and then uh, we can also uh, find out the best solutions for uh, those calculations. Uh, those calculations are crucial again for evaluating plan quality, optimizing plans through daily anatomy, and ensuring quality assurances. And there's a time constraint because of the online uh, adaptation. So the calculation speed is uh, very cr uh, crucial. So therefore, we need to trade off between time and accuracy for those calculations. Uh, Monte Carlo calculation is considered accurate, but it's really time consuming. So therefore, uh, the combining uh, analytical dose calculation with the uh, Monte Carlo uh, calculation is uh, the best choice we can use for those calculations. Okay, uh, so there is a trade-off study uh, by Nenov that uh, trade-off between the dose calculation accuracy and patient anatomy in adaptive proton therapy. Uh, daily adaptation uh, advantage outweighs uh, compri compromised uh, accuracy in a faster uh, analytical dose calculation uh, uh, algorithm. So uh, again, a uh, combination of uh, other analytical dose calculation and Monte Carlo calculation in hybrid workflow is considered and minimizes the impact of those calculation and accuracy. Okay, so having uh, calculated this, and then we need to uh, also find out the dose accumulation uh, for patient uh, uh, plan. So proper dose accumulation requires mapping for the total dose delivered to the anat each uh, anatomical uh, position consistently uh, across uh, fractions. So deformable imaging registration is commonly used for this purpose, but its accuracy can be challenging to verify the dose to dynamic changes in tissues uh, uh, during uh, treatment. So as you're experiencing uh, changing anatomy and verification issues, so tissues undergo changes during treatment and accumulating dose between CT scans can take uh, weeks apart, may not be always very appropriate. So therefore the accuracy of the deformable image resolution uh, can be difficult to verify, raising uh, concerns about its appropriateness in a, a certain scenarios. So therefore it is really uh, uh, important to validate your deformable image registration algorithm. So the choice of deformable image registration algorithm can impact those accumulation accuracy. So issues include changes in voxel mass and volume, leading to potential on physical dose accumulation, particularly in the conformal dose delivery like a proton therapy. Uh, integration is adaptation uh, workflow. Uh, again, this is a uh, really important task. And uh, previously, uh, Professor Kim mentioned about the integration into adaptation workflow is most uh, important part and is most difficult also. Uh, those accumulation can be integrated into adaptation workflow in different ways. And options include accumulating those on the new patient CT scan or back projecting it into the initial uh, planning CT, each producing a different result due to uh, patient anatomical evolution. Uh, finally, uh, treatment verification. Uh, PSQA uh, using water phantom is not uh, uh, feasible in an online adaptive workflow. 
So therefore, uh, Monte Carlo-based uh, simulation and uh, patient anatomy are proposed for plant verification. So uh, this approach uh, can demonstrate higher sensitivity uh, compared to patient-specific uh, verification measurement uh, with a log file uh, system. Okay. Then, uh, like uh, finally, I'd like to uh, very briefly touch a biological aspect of uh, plant adaptation. So, so far we have discussed about only uh, on dosimetric indices uh, for plant adaptation. Uh, however, uh, adaptation may lead to those hotspots in tumors, uh, which might be acceptable, but could complicate uh, outcome, outcome analysis in clinical trials. For OARs, uh, plant adaptation can result in doses either higher or lower than initially planned, but still within defined constraints. So treatment outcome always depends on the delivery biological dose, not physical dose. So therefore, uh, this accumulated delivery dose should be considered for this retrospective uh, outcome analysis. So adaptation can address biological considerations, especially in fractionations, account for variations in dose between fractionations. So in adaptive uh, dose correction scheme, corrections should be applied uniformly over remaining fractions to minimize variance. So uh, there are some differences between uh, uh, RBE for proton therapy and also the LAT uh, implementation uh, at the end, at the range of the uh, proton beam uh, uh, practic range. So therefore, it has to be account for a biological aspect of uh, plant adaptation. So LAT consideration may be challenging to fully maintain uh, during adaptive uh, therapy. Uh, requiring a recalculation based on daily log files for confirmation. So explicitly uh, influencing LET in the adaptive uh, workflow uh, could help reduce the impact of uh, biological uh, uncertainty. Okay, to summarize my talk, uh, online adaptive uh, therapy faces challenges and the impact on uh, treatment delivery workflow depends on the chosen uh, adaptation strategy and tools for imaging those calculation and assessment and ongoing research is focused on the technical realization of online uh, adaptive therapy. Uh, understanding the impact on treatment outcomes is crucial to determine uh, whether the disruption of uh, current clinical workflow for adaptive strategy is generally justified. And treatment adaptation is expected to be more clinically significant in highly conformal radiation therapy techniques, such as proton therapy. So range uh, variations uh, due to anatomical and set of changes in proton therapy can lead to uh, more severe dose uh, perturbation. So proton therapy presents uh, unique challenges, including typically uh, more inhomogeneous dose distributions in organs at risk as compared to uh, photon therapy. Uh, the complexity of intensity moderated treatment field in proton therapy allows for great potential in plant adaptation uh, utilizing both influence, uh, fluence and energy adjustment. And radiation therapy is shifting toward the hypofractionated uh, treatment, especially with the proton therapy's low integral dose to uh, normal tissue. Uh, changes in patient geometry might be smaller with a reduced overall treatment time and but fewer fractions uh, with uh, uh, leave uh, less room for retrospective uh, plan uh, correction. So that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, uh, we are, uh, we'll be hosting our next uh, particle therapy cooperative group uh, 62 in Singapore, uh, 2024. Uh, please mark your calendar from 10 to 14th of June, uh, 2024. So we would like to welcome and invite all of you to participate in this uh, PTCAC 62 next year. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Park, for the very detailed uh, presentation. Uh, it's uh, a lot of information for all of us. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Are there any questions? So, um, Professor Park, uh, uh, I, I, I have one question uh, regarding uh, motion management. Uh, now, mm. uh, if you had to reduce the margin with motion management, what is the best method that you would recommend for proton therapy? 
Okay. Uh, well, currently there are a number of uh, motion management system uh, uh, is available. Uh, in our clinic, we have uh, two motion management system, which is uh, one uh, is called uh, real-time uh, tumor gated system, where uh, 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 physician markers are implanted into patient uh, uh, tumor. And then uh, our system, by using the fluoroscopic imaging, and then uh, the proton will uh, trace and then track the system. The beam is always uh, it, or only can be delivered within uh, the uh, the range of the tolerance. Uh, typically, we set to uh, two to three millimeter in the range. So this works really well in our case. So, however, this is an invasive technique, so it requires to um, input, uh, insert your uh, uh, marker into the patient. Alternatively, we have another type of method using uh, enzyme uh, uh, respiratory gating system. We are using the uh, laser system to uh, change uh, the patient of position. But this is uh, you basically surrogate uh, uh, the, your out, outside of your marker. So there may be some uh, less relevant to as compared to uh, 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 real-time tumor-gated uh, therapy system. And finally, uh, we are currently we are searching for a uh, uh, surface image guided system. So we can also use for our uh, surface image guiding system uh, for uh, hopefully in the future. So it depends on the which types of tumor you are treating. And you can actually uh, 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 take uh, the best of uh, uh, possible uh, treatment uh, in your case. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, second question is uh, regarding, you know, uh, again, the same question about efficiency in adaptive radiotherapy, especially for proton beam therapy, since it is mm. so sensitive to changes. Mm. But there's a greater need to perform QA, especially patient-specific QA in prolonged mm. therapy. Mm. Uh, do, you, do you foresee uh, uh, using log file approach to be equally as accurate, for example, to predict uh, range uncertainties, for example, uh, yeah. in performing uh, fast QA? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I, I think that's a great question. Uh, so currently, we are still doing our uh, patient-specific QA for each individual patient uh, using different uh, uh, layer of a patient uh, uh, tumor volume. So mm -hmm. for, uh, for instance, uh, uh, isocenter level, uh, proximity, or uh, distal layer. But we always do uh, at least two layers. So in case if you are doing uh, five uh, spheres, that means you need to measure uh, 10 uh, measurements at yeah. least. And if we have a range shifter, and then you have to change back and put this back and forth and again and again. So it will require actually a lot of time. But however, we'll still continue to do until the end of this year to ensure our system uh, more with a, such a high confidence. But at the, at the same time, um, our group also testing our log file where uh, we extract the log file from patient uh, uh, from Hidachi system to input into our race station uh, to the back calculation and do compare with the actually original delivered field as compared to the plant field. So, so far the results are very promising. So hopefully uh, we can start using uh, next year. So definitely for online radiation therapy, for proton therapy, Definitely, you have to use a uh, log file based uh, for patient specific QA. Yes. Of course, patient specific QA using log file based also has to uh, reconfirm with uh, your uh, measurement uh, once in a while. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Here's another question from the audience. Uh, in your clinical prolonged therapy, how is the range accuracy of SOBP ensured? Okay. So, our uh, 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 range uh, measurement is uh, uh, ensured by, uh, at, at, uh, we set in one millimeter, but we see uh, less than uh, 0.2 millimeter uh, changes. I mean, I'm saying that uh, our uh, monthly QA uh, criteria for range is one millimeter. Uh, 
Uh, however, uh, we always measure uh, less than uh, 0 0.3 or 0 0.2 millimeter in the range. Uh, okay. The ranges are pretty much very accurate. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I suppose uh, for the general audience, uh, proton beam therapy has a lot of uh, technical uh, parts and physics involved. And I hope that maybe from the AFOM side, uh, we can learn more uh, on the very technical aspects of proton therapy and how everything that uh, Professor Park has given us today is related uh, to um, adaptive uh, radiotherapy as well. I mean, there are many, many terms that are used by like robust optimization, uh, range uncertainty, CT uncertainties, uh, stopping power ratio, and so on and so forth. So, uh, yeah, sure. I think we have a uh, lot to, more to learn uh, for proton beam therapy as well as adaptive radiotherapy. And there's so much that needs to be done to ensure accuracy of treatment for proton patients. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Park, and, and I'm sure all of us here appreciate uh, all the details that you've given us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, again, uh, my big apologies because uh, I got COVID. That's why you know my voice is very shaky, and I, I'm very yeah, sorry so about. So thank know, you very much, and we really wish you uh, a good okay. rest. Please <laughs> take care and hope that you will recover well. Yeah, okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you let me share the screen too? Thank you. Yeah, abs absolutely. Sorry, uh, just one second. Uh, my, my tool is gone. <laughs> so I don't know how do I go back. Uh, can you, can somebody tell me how to, because my tool is gone. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Yeah. I cannot see my tool. Okay. okay it's all right. So, okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, you can see. Yeah? So, um, uh, uh, we, we are very privileged to have uh, Professor Kim and uh, Professor Park to give us uh, two talks uh, this afternoon. For the third talk, uh, we have Dr. Tan Hong Chi, Hong Chi Tan from uh, the National Cancer Center uh, in Singapore. Um, Dr. Uh, Tan Hong Chi himself completed his PhD in National University of Singapore in 2018, and he received a first class in physics from the uh, University, NUS, in 2013. He then joined the National Cancer Center Singapore in 2018, completed his uh, residency in 2020, and is currently a senior medical physicist in uh, NCCS at the Division of Radiation Oncology. Is also uh, uh, qualified and certified by the International Medical Physics uh, Certification Board and is also a clinical instructor in the Duke NUS Medical School. And uh, in NCCS, uh, he was awarded the IAA Fellowship for Attachment to the Korea National Cancer Center in 2022. He won the Singh Health Allied Health Young Discoverer Award in 2021. He was also a CFOM Young Leader Award, uh, received the award in 2023, and the recent IUPAC, the International Union for Physics and Applied Physics Early Career Scientist Award in 2023, just this year alone. Uh, he's currently leading the Medical Physics Research Group in NCCS with research interests in uh, proton dosimetry, adaptive radiotherapy, and application of artificial intelligence in radiation oncology. And he has published over 40 uh, peer reviewed papers and has received research grants of value of over 400,000 US dollars over the last four years. And he's currently helping to set up a second major in medical physics at the Nanyang Technological University that is in Singapore as well to enhance the medical physics education in Singapore. So we are happy to have uh, Dr. Tan with us today to speak about AI and deep learning in adaptive video therapy, the progress and challenges that we face today. So uh, I will hand this time to uh, Dr. Tan. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Professor, Professor James, for kind introductions. Okay, let me share screen. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, I guess most of us can see the screen. Great. So this is a topic of my presentation, yes. and I have no conflict of interest to declare. So this is a content. I'll talk about some ERT nomenclatures, then go on to the AI applications and challenges in the quest for online ERT. So as I will show later, right, AI in ERT is equivalent to AI in all the sub-processes in neurotherapy. So these are all the things that we shall talk about. And then lastly, I will just conclude with the general challenges of AI and how to move forward. So AI and ART is actually a very, very large um, topics in general. So I will just assume that the audience right, either has a practical or very technical understandings of AI already. So I'll just jump right into AI in radio therapy. So as shown here, um, most of us probably um, agree that AI is here to change radiation oncology. So as shown in this nature review, right, uh, you can see that AI right, will actually change all the entire um, workflow in real therapy from simulations to plannings and to the uh, treatment delivery. And the AI also helps to guide um, clinician um, decision supports, clinical decision supports, and such as uh, outcome prediction and, and so on. So, yes. So first off, what is ART? So in case anybody uh, thought of this question, right? So ART is actually um, first uh, defined in this paper about 25 years ago, so by Professor Dian. So, and in essence, it pretty much captures everything. It is, uh, yeah. So it is a close to radiation treatment uh, process, okay? And the treatment plan can be modified using systematic feedback of measurements. And this, this idea is definitely very forward thinking at that point of time. And there are only two terms which require some clarification um, in, in current context. So it's improved radiation treatment. What does it really mean? And what are the kind of treatment vision we can expect? So I'll just try to clarify these two terms uh, in the context of more recent publications as well as um, um, recent advances in ART. Okay, so this paper actually defined um, the intent of ART, I mean, or classified the intent of ART into these um, five categories. So they're all in Latin. So ex equio means you try to maintain the original plan coverage and uh, constraints. OER, you try to reduce the OER doses during the um, um during the treatment process. And PLEO, tumor dose escalation, reduction, reduction of CTV volume and totally dose escalation and CTV volume reductions during uh, treatment costs. So uh, in general, in this uh, at least in this presentation, our intent of ART will be meant as a PLEO. That means you try to maintain the original plan coverage and all the constraints. And then when it comes to treatment variation, what kind of treatment variation we, can we expect? I mean, it's best to um, see this in terms of the time scale. So, I mean, in the second time scale, we have all the intrafractional motions, which include breathing motion and coughing and, and so on. In the daily time scale, you can have all the interfraction motions and all the geometrical changes. So that, this includes nasal, rectal, bladder, feeling changes, or even your lung effusion and, and so on. And in the, week, in the weekly scale, you can expect biological change and tumor response. So your, I mean, Chances are during the radio course of radio therapy, um, the tumor will shrink depending on the um depending on the tumor response. And then some are more uh, fast responding, such as MPC, rectal, esophagia. Some are actually less uh less responsive in general. Okay, so our, at least in this context, our ART will tackle the daily and the weekly time scale. Okay. Then it's also <clears throat> possible to uh, classify ART by the frequency of adaptation. So as actually defined here, there are different kinds of uh, frequency. You can adapt at a fixed uh, interval, the first, the, the top row. And this means that, well, I mean, this is probably in, uh, in the context of, you know, if you do have IGRT, you have CDCT, then you just say that I will do a re-CT in uh, halfway through my treatment course. So that, that's what it means. And then there's a trigger adaptation. So this in the context of, let's say you have an IGRT, you have a CD, daily CDCT, then if let's say um, the therapist or the clinicians do the IGRT, do a CDC and see that eh, there's too much um, geometrical changes. And they decided to do all those calculations and they realized, okay, we should adapt. So this is called triggered adaptations. And there's a frequent adaptation whereby you always, uh, regardless of the clinician call, you add, you do a dose calculation every day and compare for plan dose. And if it exceeds certain threshold that you set, then you do an adaptation. And lastly, there's an iterative adaptation, which means that 
you just adapt the plan every single day and you just compare the and then and then every day you just compare the with the plan that um you have the day before. So <clears throat> of course you can uh the more frequent, I mean the iterative adaptation is going to be very, very resource intensive. And and the frequency of this adaptation, a lot of times is going to be a function of two things, your clinical resources and the expected anatomical changes. So I mean if um, some patient is going, going through concurrent chemotherapy, they can expect that you know you need to pay more attention to this tumor change because the chances of the tumor will actually shrink uh, very early on in the treatment course. And then uh, as the previous speaker has uh, mentioned, there's an online and uh, offline ART. So after defining the frequency of adaptation, I mean there are different kinds of frequency of adaptation, then the next part is how fast do you want to adapt? So the speed of adaptation will, will actually tell you whether are you online or offline. Online aims to like with the with, uh, let's say your IGRT today, then you try to adapt the plans pretty much on the spot within an hour or within half an hour. Okay. And then offline means that of course it's a delay. And then you do the you can do a re-CT and then you wait several days and treat the new plans. So I did a so here's a um pro and cons of this online versus offline. Of course, online. The biggest pro of online is that you avoid treating the flawed dose distribution. That means your dose distribution is always most compatible with your current with the current patient's anatomy. So this is the best. But of course, the downside is that it's going to be very resource intensive and it's going to be time critical. I mean, if you're going to do your online ART six hours later, then it's kind of defeat the purpose. Right, right? You're doing off. Yeah, the middle anatomy will change. So, so the idea is online ART is kind of like the holy grail. I mean, this will give the patient the best dose distribution. And therefore, if you want to achieve online ART, you want um you want your time to be you want your entire real therapy workflow to be very very short, very succinct. And this is a part. This is where AI will actually plays a huge role. And then these are uh, these are areas where AI will change or uh, will have a role to play in the real therapy process. So in the daily imaging, the IGRT parts, um. Deep AI will actually will, 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 will help in the image enhancement. And then after the imaging, then you need to have the contours, right? And auto segmentations, and it depends. If you don't want auto segmentation, you want a DIR kind of contour propagations, then having a, a ways to kind of predict the quality of DIR is actually very helpful. It, it removes the elements of, of, of clinicians or human interventions to look through your DIR, um, whether it's accurate or not. And then after having the contour, next is pl planning. This will take a, huge, uh, a lot of time. And less if you have auto planning, it's going to add on a more time. And lastly, PSQA. Uh, so most of the time, I think most centers still use a uh, phantom-based QA. And if let's say you want to treat for new, you want to do online ART and you want to treat uh, while the patient is still on the couch, then th there's no way you can do a phantom QA. So the idea is, can you use AI to do a virtual QA or phantomless QA? So I'll go on to the first part first. A, uh, CBC image enhancement. So uh, most ART workflow will require those calculations on CT quality daily images. So this, this is definitely true. And we all know that CBC has an in inaccurate issue and is contaminated with all the scatters and motion artifacts. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of work being done uh, in using generative AI to enhance image qualities. And the idea is to uh, use a PET CBCT and a CT uh, data as a training so as a training data. So this is a very, very nice review article. So it's about the current um the current uh, architecture that's used for generative AI for this image enhancement. So you have UNET, GAN, conditional GAN, cycle GAN, and, and so on. So cycle GAN is pretty much the uh, the best, better performing one. So this paper by SKL is probably the first work on a cycle games. And you can see that on uh, the CBCT on the leftmost panel, right? I mean, you can see the scatter contaminations. And the synthetic in the middle column actually looks a lot very, very close to the CT quality. So it's actually very, very good. And in another work, you can also see similar results. The CT and the CBCT, and then the issue difference is a lot. Whereas if you go to the um they if you if they enhance the CBCT, they actually get a lesser issue difference. So the advantage of this cycle again is um, is clear from here. 
And we also did our own study and we presented it last year during uh, Mikai. And then we also show that, well, it's possible to actually using cytogen architecture to bring your issue to very, very close to um, your CT values. So the green is a CBCT, the red and blue is a CT and the synthetic CT. So some 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 learning points while, while we go with cycle again is that uh, we, we have to decide beforehand are you working with 2D, 2.5D, or 3D model. So this is going to affect your memory usage and, and so on. And then <clears throat> when you think about data augmentations, um, and then you and then also data pre-processing, because a lot of times you're going to have a lot of air, a lot of air around your I mean, your pelvis or your, your, your anatomy. So you might want to get rid of those air first, or even have couch. Your couch actually be a confounder, all these things. So you might want to remove your couch as well. And then there's also a question whether you want to do image registration between the CBCT and the CT. So do you want to register them using rigid or deformable? So all these things are things to think about. And cycle again, or again, architecture in general is very, very hard to train. You know, they're very prone to mode collapse. That means they just settle down to one solution and it's really not training, and then we just have to retrain. So our experience is, um, again, is actually very difficult. And uh, we are moving on to other architectures, which probably we'll present during the next year conference. And yeah, actually it's a diffusion-based model. But, but this is not something I'll go into in this talk. So some of the challenges with this kind of cities with um, generative model is that um, in our experience, generative models, so we have very interesting, peculiar uh, generative results at the start where when we put in the bladder, when we put in the pelvis uh, CBCT, we actually had pockets of air in the bladder in the synthetic CT. And that's because in our and that's what in our in our training data, there are, there are, there are cases where you know there are um, there's bower gas in CBCT and there's no bower gas in uh, in the CT. And, and and that's what happened. So end up when you train right uh, in the bladder, there's a pocket of air uh, coming up. And it, it's not it's definitely not uh, real. And this brings out the question like you is you cannot really trust um generative AI um by right away. You, you probably have to do some assessment first. And sometimes this kind of deep learning models actually work very, very well for um, data that's straight on. So if you if it's a data from out of the distribution, then it probably will not perform well. And a lot of times, right, when you're using the, all these AI algorithms and if you're doing it in clinical workflow, you will not have time to notice this kind of thing. So it will be good, right, if let's say there are mechanisms to detect this kind of out of distribution data sets that will flag up, say, hey, this, this um, CBCT is out of distribution. Please pay attention to the, um, to the outputs, the gener generative AI outputs. And then uh, another part also related is, um, it's also good if, let's say, I mean, there's also mechanisms to point out areas of uh, high issue uncertainties in, in the generative model. So this will also prompt the user to pay closer attention to the um, to the generative AI outputs. And lastly, it's also value proposition in comparison in comparison non AI methods. So, uh, research in the 2023 version, latest version, they have actually this they have two algorithms to convert uh, to, to get to a synthetic CT. One is a corrected CBCT and one is a virtual uh, CBCT or virtual CT. So virtual is based on deformal registration, just mapping the issue based on deformal registration. And corrected is actually based on iterative issue lookup table. So this is actually very, it's a very, very interesting method. So it's it based on deformable first, just to get the eight um, pixel to kind of register to each other. And then they will do the pixel mapping and then they'll do this iteratively, uh, including pixels that is, that is close to the um, lookup line and then excluding pixel that's not close to the lookup line, then they then they, then they will get an image specific uh, lookup table. So this is not some so this lookup table is not something that you have to um uh partition yourself. It's something that the, they will figure out from the image themselves. It's image specific. And the nice thing is the final corrected CBCT is not a deform, it's not based on deform. So the anatomy still follow a CBCT. They only use the deformer to get the issue lookup table. And there are two recent papers, uh, one in 2022 for photons and one in 2023 for protons, uh, which I do not show here, which shows that when they compare the gamma at 2%, 2 millimeters, you can get more than 98%. And even for the protons, the 1% one M, they're getting more than, they're getting better than uh, 91%. So, I mean, if you are using this kind of 
it should look up table, you can get this kind of results. Then the question is what additional value can this generative AI actually give you? Do you really need to be do you really need your 1% one and then to be 100 percent and so on? So it's about the value proposition. So but again, uh we, we have these algorithms and uh, our results is going to be published soon. So but we have some very we got very, very similar results. Our 2%, 2 percent, two millimeters or so more than 98 percent. But we got other interesting results as well, whereby uh we point out certain clinical situation where corrected CBCT will fail. Yeah. Okay. And then next AI in auto segmentation. So just <clears throat> introducing some computer vision lingo. So uh I know that in ART we I mean I know that in uh, real therapy we use auto segmentation, but actually in computer vision literature, right? It's not a semantic segmentation. So if you want to look up more for those um computer vision papers, then you can uh, use these keywords. So the rest of the tasks are actually more relevant for maybe diagnostic radiology, but for radiotherapy, we are more interested in semantic segmentation. So the idea is actually to segment OERs and maybe in some cases targets. Okay. So there's a lot of uh, commercial products out there, and I'm only including um you know, the products from Europe and the US. And I know there's a, a, a handful of products coming out from Asia, from Korea, from um, China. And therefore, there's probably close to about two dozens of, you know, commercial auto-segmentation software out there. And, and all these software are pretty much on deep learning based. So there's a very nice review paper here. We talk about advances in auto-segmentation. So, um, there are more than one ways to um, do auto segmentation. Deep learning is definitely one of the cutting edge, now, but I mean, there are other uh, methods, atlas based, and even a more very, very rudimentary, um, just intensity and thresholding based methods. But what is clear from the graph is that deep learning methods, right, sticking out is uh, in the past, probably um, past decades. So, deep learning methods, because the performance is actually picking up. And first question is how does deep learning uh, methods compare to atlas based methods? So um, there are quite a couple of other public publications, but I just pick up two. So these two actually compare deep learning and atlas based method. And if you look across the dice scroll, the deep learning method actually performs better than the atlas based methods. And again, here, if you look at head and neck, thoracic, everything, all different regions, again, the blue color is a deep learning, also outperforms the atlas based method. So the consensus is that deep learning method is, is probably going to be a Give you a better, higher quality um, segments compared to Atlas based method, and, and that's also a reason why you know the deep learning um publications is actually going up in, in, in the past decades. And then the next question is, uh, with so many commercial software out there, how does how does it really compare? So this is a very very recent publication that compares five commercial um uh, softwares, and I mean there's still um pretty heterogeneous kind of performance. I mean, we have our own um, data. We also compare four to five commercial um, companies um, we publish next year. Uh, we, are, we do also uh, observe this kind of uh, heterogeneous kind of um, uh, results. But the, con but the conclusion is here. Between, compare between not having your uh, auto-segmentation software and between having your auto-segmentation software, the time saving is huge. But I mean, of course, between auto segmentation software, I mean, there's some um, variable performance, but it's going to be marginal compared to the time saving if you're just getting an auto segmentation software. But that being said, given that so there's a heterogeneous kind of performance across uh, different commercial software, it's actually worthwhile to actually do a, you know, if you're going to buy, then, then it's actually worthwhile to do a, a due diligence, to do a good assessment. So in this paper, they talk about um, how do you assess uh, auto controlling software and radiotherapy. So uh, one thing is, so there are several, and they outline the steps shown here. And one thing is you need to know what's the input data. The reason because, again, as mentioned previously, deep learning models actually uh, do very well on data that they are trained on. And therefore there's an algorithmic bias. And therefore um, it means that there might be an ethnic bias. I mean, it suits best for the, um, Western population, it doesn't suit, it, it doesn't um, work well for Asian population. Disability bias, it could be you know if you have prosthetic, non-prosthetic kind of things, and then uh, again, young patients or uh, adult patients, and most most data will be trained on adult patients. So 
if let's say you are a pediatric center, then you can, then you have to ensure that uh, the auto-segmentation software actually work well for your for your patient cohort. And also a patient medical intervention that with stands and so on. And then once you know the data inputs, then you have to do a very, very good commissioning step, your physics commissioning and clinical commissioning. And then uh, there's going to be a case-specific quality assurance. That means when you're running through each case, there needs to be a mechanism in, in place to check the uh, quality of your control. So clinical commissioning is pretty important. So is to make sure that um, the auto segmentation software that you buy right, is actually um, serving your needs, your central needs. And there are a few ways to assess this based on our metrics. So you have geometry metrics, uh, which is, I mean, you can use dice score, you can use host of distance and, and jacket score, all these kind of things. The dosimetric index uh, metrics, you have the impact on the dosimetrics, time saving metrics, and even qualitative you know, assessment. Yeah, that means based on that, uh, let the clinicians um, gauge which one is better. So, yeah. So, in general, uh, OER segmentation is very, very easy. So, because there's a clear anatomical boundaries, but the challenge is that CTV is actually very hard to contour. You know, there's no clear anatomical boundaries, and sometimes you might you require uh, other imaging modality like MR or PETs. So, I mean, there are guidelines, uh, like RTOG, all these guidelines exist, but all these have room for interpretations, and sometimes the clinician will customize based on their understanding of the patient. Like if it's a young patient, an old patient, I mean, the, the clinician will actually kind of control this a bit differently. And let's say it's a re radiation case or not, then all these things will actually vary. But nonetheless, from a technical viewpoint, it's still possible to arrive at some kind of auto segmentation for CTV. So there are essentially four methods to do it. So uh, you can have the uh, more rudimentary voting weighted average state staple algorithm. So let's say you have five different observers, five different CTV from your very experienced uh, clinicians. Then what you can do is you can do a voting, or you can do a state one staple algorithm, and you can get a consensus uh, consensus control from it. And this can be representing CTV. But uh, there are, um, but apart from this, there's another method, the confidence interval. So this one is um, for more for practical use. So if let's say, because we know that CTV is going to vary a lot across clinicians, so it will be good if let's say, you know, during the auto segmentation, they actually point out in which area right, does the clinicians uh, disagree upon the most. And this will actually help the clinician to pay more attention to, hey, okay, I need to pay more attention. I need to maybe tailor this to my own understanding of the patient. So, I mean, uh, this paper actually um, determine the uncertainty from uh, Using a deep learning yep. network. And then next is a style aware deep BL network. So there's a, a so it's an auto encoder network. So there's an encoder and decode to different physician styles. So I did actually it's actually training five different networks. Is what I mean. We have used the auto encoder, so it's a bit simpler than that. So the idea is well, uh let's say you have five different clinicians that have different contours, then you just input these five clinicians as a train five clinicians control as a training data and you get uh, five different results and then to, depending on which control or uh, which clinicians actually comes in. Okay. Okay, next. <clears throat> so uh, about predicting DRR quality. So um, DRR is used in ART workflow for these three reasons. First, it can be used to generate synthetic CT by deforming the CT to uh, CBCT. So it's uh, like a virtual C uh, CT method which I talked about in, in the race station or you can use it in mean vista and, or anything. You can, or, and then second is can be used to deform OER and target volume. So let's say you don't have an auto segmentation software, then you can use a DRR to kind of map the o, your contours, the OER and targets to your um, synthetic CT. So like that, you don't have to purchase your uh, auto segmentation software. And lastly is to walk a dose to a single CT set in dose accumulation. So if you want to um, get the actual delivered those throughout all fashion, you need to do those walking. So this application is um uh, is kind of is important, but um uh, if you're doing daily dose evaluation, you don't have to do a walk um dose walking. But in the grand scheme of um in the grand scheme of clinical decision support, you actually do need this because a five percent dose discrepancy in the first fraction that is not the same as a five percent dose discrepancy in the last fraction. If it's a five percent dose discrepancy in the first fraction, you have to think about um whether it's systematic or not systematic. If it's systematic, then then this might propagate forever, and you might want to do a um 
and you want to do a, a reCT at, 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 at that time point. But if it's the last fraction, you probably can just say that or just five percent for the one fraction out of the fraction is fine. Yeah. Okay. So there are various methods to do this VR operation. So most of the work done are um, by the PSI group. So in this case, right, they use a simple linear regression algorithms to use the deformation vector field DVF to predict for the maximum, um, the maximum DVF uncertainties. So they show that it is feasible. And then the event, when they publish a second paper, which instead of using the linear regression, they use a deep learning model. And from here, they actually show the DVF. I mean, they show the heat map over here, and you can see uh, area with this kind of um those this kind of gradient right shows that there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in the deformation vector field, and and you have to um pay more attention to the deformation in this region. So I think we did similar work as well, but rather than using uh predicting for the uncertainty and DVF right, we predict uh we predict for dice score because uh we have. We, we have contours in the CBCT because our clinician contour on it. And then uh, we calculate the dice score between the CBCT and the CT. And this can be a, a bit, a bit between the deformed um, CT and the, and the CBCT. So this can be a surrogate for the deformation quality. So using a deep learning model, Sammy's network, we show that using your chromium CT and your deformed CT is possible to predict for the DSC with a room in square error of uh, less than 0 0.1 general. And then accuracy is we can achieve up to uh, 80%. And then apart from using uh, deep learning methods, we also use the machine learning methods. And again, we are getting very good performance with ESC errors of uh, less than 0 0.05 in general. Okay, so uh, next part, AI in auto planning. So currently there are three uh, methods to get um to generate AI based planning. So there's a direct fluence map, there's an optimal uh, dose prediction and a post to plan conversion. So a direct fluence map means that with the daily anatomy as an input, as a structure set as an input, you try to predict for the fluence maps directly. Now optimal dose prediction try to predict for the 3D volumetric um doses and then from there you try to do either dose mimicking or re-optimization to get the fluence. And then or the third method, right? Planning parameter prediction means that you try to predict for, for the planning parameters, your um the weights of the optimizations, the those threshold for the optimizations, and then you do a, a re-optimization to get a final plan. So let's take a look at the um direct fluence method first. So this is an example of direct fluence methods. So again, um these are kind of um uh, architecture which they use. And over here is a result from the TPS and one from the AI. And in general, you can see the fluence map uh, matches pretty well. Just that you know the AI method is a bit uh smoother and the TPS is a bit choppy. And okay, let's see. Uh, okay. and on the right column, right, you can also see the DVH comparison. So one thing that is clear from here is that um the DVH right. You can see that there's some statistical significance over here, and it shows that the AI doesn't perform as good as the TPS. So this is one of the downside of a direct fluence because there is no uh, real optimization. So you don't get the best um, um best doses. But this is actually very, very fast. And then here is a method using uh, the um, dose prediction. So the idea is that um they will get the do they will get the predicted dose using the CT and the structure set, and then PTV and all the CT as the inputs, and then they will get a final dose distribution. And you can see that the dose distribution actually matches very, very well. The AI predicted dose and the, and then after having the dose distribution, right, then they will do a re-optimization and they will get a final doses and a uh, final fluence as well. And you can see that this is a comparison between the final dose. And the um and the AI generated those and actually there's not much difference. Okay. And this again, this one is um the third method using planning parameter uh prediction. So they use the OVH and the TVH. So this is the overlap volume. So they use the overlap volume and the target volume with different expansions. 
and they use as usually as input to train the models to predict for the uh, planning parameters. Um, the dose threshold that they should use for all the PTV and so on. And they show that using these right, they can, they can get plant qualities which you know uh which is actually kind of um non distinguish non distinguish distinguishable from those uh, manually planned. So AP is the auto plant, MP is a manually plant. And actually they let the clinician read the plants and they show that actually there's no difference. But then there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh, planning time reductions. So here's here's a kind of comparison between these three methods. So direct fluence, as mentioned earlier, is very fast because there's no uh, mathematical optimization involved. But you will not it will not give you a most optimal plan. You know, there's no uh, inverse optimization taking place. And then um uh, yeah, and then the option. And then the predicted fluence also yeah I mean one of the reason also because I mean the dose diffusion is bad because the fluency will be converted to deliverable IMRT plan. So this one could also worsen the dose distribution. Okay, optimal dose prediction um is actually a good method, but the idea is that it has too many subcomponents. That means you, you need to do the three D dose prediction. Then you need to do a re -opt You need to kind of modify your re optimize your optimizer to kind of uh, optimize based on the dose distribution that you want. So this is kind of um it will consume quite it will be quite um it will take some time to develop this kind of thing. So it resource intensive. Those those the plan conversion is easier. I mean, just predicting for um the dose threshold of the weights. But the question is that it's not actually applicable for a very complex case. Let's say for head and neck, let's say you want two clinician, clinician and different uh demand for the dose levels, or let's say in cases with re-radiation, the dose control will totally be different. Okay. And then last part, AI and ART, so patient specific quality assurance. So there's a nice review article in 2021. So this the top uh diagram shows the current PSQA workflow. And the idea is that we want to replace this with a virtual uh, QA. So we, we want to have a DL or ML models and then we predict the passing rates. So you can either try to predict for the gamma passing rates or you can try to predict for the errors, the MLC errors, the M in terms of like how many millimeters or in terms of MU errors. So there are, kind, there are many kind of predictors that can use. You can use plant complexity or you can use radiomics or the quite those geomics features on the fluence of the doses. And the targets are, as mentioned earlier, to be gamma passing rate or the NLC or the um, MU errors. Okay. So uh, we did some work. So over here, we actually use our outlier detection. So not really a classification. So we predict for a gamma passing rate. And we got a pretty, in general, we, got, we can get pretty good result if you recall one machine sensitivity. You get a sensitivity of one, which means you are, capture, you are capturing all the failure case. Um, but the best precision that we have is 56%, which is about, that means your false positive rate is about 50%. So this is actually very comparable to um, what has been published outside, I mean, at least in the PSQA context. Most of the PSQA uh, machine learning deep learning people are able to achieve sensitivity of close to 100%. But a lot of times the precision is only about 50%, which means you'll get 50% false positive rate. I mean, it seems bad, but in the context of um, PSQA, most of the time you don't expect a lot of failing plans. You might expect about maybe an example five or three failing plans a year, and a uh, fifty percent four positive rate shed means that it's just another five, which is a four positive. So it's still not too bad. Yeah. So and one advantage about using outlier detection is that um, because P failing. Uh, failing plans are actually not very, very common. So if you do a normal classification models, you are going to have a lot of uh, class imbalance. I mean, there are algorithms to kind of um, account for it using classification, but it's still uh, uh, harder to train. But using outliers in detection algorithm, right, it means that you train just with a single class. You train with the inliers, and you kind of get the decision boundaries that kind of conform to your inlier the most. And those that's outside the decision boundary are your outliers. So this method is actually very, very easy to train compared to uh, classification for this kind of class imbalance issues. Okay. And then next, we also did some similar work of using, of predicting orthodoxymetry, uh, our PSQ result using log file derived errors. So this is also possible. Yeah. 
So generally, there's an increasing publication interest in this AI method, uh, AI-based method for virtual PSQ. Now, some of the challenges is we have yet to agree on a meaningful target variable to predict for. I mean, uh, I mean, as, as of now, the PSQA, uh, what is the best instrument, or what is the best gal passing rate criteria to use for each site, each treatment, SBRT, or normal conventional, all these are still really not agreed upon. So we need to agree upon, I mean, there need to be consensus on this first before we can really, you know, move ahead and start training data, start training a model for, for it. And next is, Okay, because of the nature of this problem, where it's a case of uh, extreme class imbalance, most of the time your plan don't fail. The PSQA most of the time are, are, are good. So you need more of this kind of certain plans. And, and sometimes the only way to get it is through uh, multi-institutional collaboration. Yeah. Okay, so as of now, right? Yeah, I think we've, we've gone through quite a lot of materials and that's only on how to adapt, how to online adapt. So there's still a lot of questions that's left unanswered, like when do we want when do we want to adapt? So do you want to adapt every single fraction? I mean, it's always a threshold between the plan quality and the man hours. I mean, there's always some gain in adapting every day. But the question is, is it clinically significant? And a lot of times it's also resource and time consuming. And then who to adapt? Are you gonna do a personalized? Are you gonna do a, a personalized kind of adaptation or cohort based? And just say that okay, we, I'm not going to look at each patient. Just for all K and net cases, I will do a, a re CT at a halfway through the treatment course. And also, the why should we adapt? The intent of the adaptation, essentially, is it dose driven or biological, biologically driven, biomarkers and, and so on. So, in a large part, right? To answer this question, you actually need a clinical digital support system. It's because this, to answer all these uh, questions in a very objective and robust manner, you, you, a lot of times you're taking a lot of data, multi omics data, and then um, and it's actually not very, and, and to process all this data, you need an algorithm and mathematical framework to do it. So, and you need computerized uh, uh, computerization to, uh, to help, uh, help you know, give an answer to all these questions. It's not something that we can uh, look at the CT and test. We can answer all this in a very objective manner. So just some definition. So yeah, this is a definition of a clinical digital support system, computerized program to analyze patient data. So mainly because a lot of time this could be a huge data, multiple mixed data, and then uh, because of this it is best handled by algorithms and computers. But that being said, they are very very simple CDSS to very, very complicated CDSS. So I will just start with very simple one to very um more sophisticated one. So uh, a very simple one would be something like this. So it's actually a very, this is actually a very nice paper. So they actually get the DVH parameters of all the daily doses. Okay, and then from there, they do a clustering and they identify four clusters. So the four clusters actually correspond to correct treatment, suggest replan, bias, and uh, warning. So the last two just means that you don't have to trust the model. So, and, and it's very, very interesting. And uh, from here, you can see that from the clustering, they will suggest that most of the patient uh, will do a replant on the fourth week. And with this algorithm, with this algorithm, they show that um, uh, with the clustering, the, the suggested replanting uh, days by the algorithm kind of agree with the suggested replanting days by the radio oncologist. I mean, most of them actually lie along the straight line. So this is, is very, very simple, but you know, it is actually a very nice decision support system. It helps to tell the patient, okay, when when should you um uh, when should you try to adapt plans? And next, so something very, very simple, just a simple decision tree, not based on images, not based on um uh, DVH, but it's just based on clinical data. And from here, right, they will they will try to predict which patient has a higher propensity for uh, primary tumor volume change and which patient has a high propensity for nodal tumor volume change. So again, this is something also very, very helpful. You know, if you know that this patient is going to have a, uh, it's going to be very prone to primary tumor volume change, then the patient will actually pay more attention to the CBCT and do a daily review, and so on. And then now is the more sophisticated methods, uh, method. So this is a work by you know Professor Isam Al Naka, 
So he's kind of like the big guy in AI in radio oncology. He has a he has a very very nice textbook as well. So from here, I actually have this very uh pre treatment assessment, and then after the pre treatment assessment with a single dose fraction, then they will take in the multi omics data and then they will adapt the dose. They will adapt the fractional dose, and the idea is to maximize the TCP and the NTCP. So of course there's a, a lot of uh, deep learning algorithms and um in here. And over here, they apply these uh, methods to some of the retrospective um, trial. So actually, there's a trial that um, do this kind of fractional dose adaptation. And, and um, the point here right, shows the actual, you can see the, the fraction, the grape of fraction right, actually changes. So that's actually, a, in the trial, they actually adapt the dose. And the algorithm actually outputs the, um, the dose as well. And you can see that I mean it doesn't agree perfectly, but I mean at least it's a very very good start here. And then over here, um, there's a better agreement in general for HTC. Yeah. And then next is uh reinforcement learning. Uh, so this actually uses reinforcement learning biological models. So over here again, they try to adapt the fractional dose. So again, all these are really biologically driven kind of um adaptation. And over here they show that so this is a pure simulation study and they show that um why is the optimal dose to get the for the um to achieve the highest tumor control probability so so it's worth pointing out that there's actually an optimal stopping uh, radiation therapy consortium the idea is actually try to um look at biomarkers and decide um what is the best fractionation scheme for each patient so I think this probably um this will be very, very exciting and yeah, probably there will be more updates in the future conferences from this consulting. Okay, so coming to the challenges of the AI. So these are some of the general challenges. So there are two kinds of challenges in general. So there's a technical challenges and a kind of clinical or more software aspect of the challenge of, of, of the challenge. So um on the technical challenge, first of all, is explainable AI. The idea is that for us to trust um results generated by AI, you have to it has to be explainable to a certain extent. So what I mean, so let's say there's an AI model and then they, they input an image and it show, shows that the person is COVID infected. You do not know how the model made the prediction, and, and this makes it very um you know unexplainable. But if let's say there's a kind of a heat map. Or, or, or in let's say or in CNN, they call it Brad Carey. Then in this heat map, you can say, okay, I'm making this decision based on this region. Then the user can look at this region and say, okay, that's, is this sensible? And this actually gives us the greater confidence. Deep learning methods is inherently not uh, explainable. But there are a lot of models itself which are uh, inherently explainable, like logistic regression, decision tree, and so on. So, yeah. And then next is, this is also kind of related to a point that I was mentioned earlier. Um, these papers are point, nature medicine papers are pointed out that for us to actually really use uh, AI generated outputs in, in the clinic, it must also out convey the predictive uncertainty. So it is not enough to tell us that this is a result, but you need to tell us that uh, how certain are you of the results. And people that is in the field of AI or deep learning will know that it's not straightforward to actually kind of generate, you know, confidence interval or predictive prediction interval. It's, it's not something that is um it's not something that is easy to do. And, and what does this uncertainty actually mean? A lot of times you need to do all this bootstrapping and you might need to, so it's not something that is straightforward. So even though we need it in clinic, but actually there's still some technical challenges in generative in generating all these uncertainties or technical aspects. Yeah. And then next is data set shift. Again, uh, this is a really good point which I have mentioned earlier. So deep learning works very well for data that is trained on, on machine learning, learning as well. So the idea is that, you know, in clinic, sometimes the there might be a, the data set might shift for, for many, many different reasons. It can be because of um you have a different CT machines, or it can be a, it can be due to demographic change and, and show and so on. So the idea is. How do you know that this data set actually changed? So one way is you can have an independent data set. Uh, I mean, one way is you can 
has an algorithm to detect this uh, data set shift. And let's say, um, and it's also, and also because of this, right? It's all good for you to, it's also important to know the origin of the data used in the training models. So if you know the origin of data used in these training models, then you will, I mean, you will be able to know whether there's a data set shift in, in, in a certain way. So these are uh, my challenges. And then um, coming to the software aspects. So there are two problems of uh, AI. I mean, more from a practice and clinical point of view. So there's an automation complacency and there's automation bias. So automation complacency is an insufficient attention paid to monitoring the output of the of the, of the you know, AI generated outputs. And automation bias is you believe in AI even though it contradicts what you understand. So both are different and is and currently uh, is believed that uh, automation bias can actually be solved by proper educations of the people using AI and telling them that you must always you know trust your human instinct or uh, trust your human judgment and so on. But automation complacency is just something that's very, very hard. Um, hard to you know uh, solve by um education because people just people have pay attention to it at the start but after a while if everything goes on very well they will just you know drift into autopilot mode and not pay attention to the outputs so but from workflow point of view it's actually possible to you know to, um there are many many checks in place it's actually possible to hash against automation complacency and then next Next part is how do you um, commission and do a, a quality assurance for AI based kind of uh, applications? So there's a recommendation here, but we believe that um, all these things will actually keep evolving and changing. So they propose uh, two kinds of quality assurance, case specific quality assurance and routine model quality assurance. So routine model quality assurance means that you know just make sure that your model uh your model is working the same. One year ago and now, so you can have a, you can have an independent data set and you run it, uh, periodically and make sure that output is always the same. And case specific QA means that for each generated, uh, AI outputs you in, in a clinic, there must be some kind of you know case specific QA. You need to check the AI um results, AI generated results. I mean there are various ways to do it. It can be a manual ver verifications or you, you might want to develop um, yeah so yeah so you, you might want to develop a kind of algorithm to check your output as well yes so here's an example so this is a this is one example of a of ai generated uh, oars commercial software so you realize that the eyes is happening at a different place. So if you do not do a proper QA, you don't do a pro proper commissioning, this is what you will see. So if you do a proper commissioning, you can tell the vendor that okay, this is not the desired results. And this is not giving us the desired results. Can you please uh, modify the models and so on? So this is from a real commercial software that we have. And lastly, it's about education. So this is a TCS uh, kind of report generally uh, from IEA this year, 2023. So they kind of, um, Put the safety use of AI in in uh in clinic right under the purview of you know medical physicists. So the question is then like how do you be in charge of something if you are not trained in it? So the alternative of kind of set of syllabus for us, you know, that that things that we must know regards to all these AI algorithms. But the question is also this AI algorithm is con is constantly evolving. It's not like radiation physics, you know, your fine machine art cross-section is not going to change in five years or 10 years, but all this AI development is going to change in five and 10 years. So it's going to be also very challenging for us and to keep abreast with all the changes. So these are things that we have to eventually, that we have to tackle if we, if we were to use, um, I mean, if we would, if metaphysicists were to be in charge of um, AI in the clinic. Okay, so here are the acknowledgements and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. Uh, it's been a very nice talk and uh, very broad and yet deep in a certain way. Uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience?
Hmm. Here's one question. Is there any way to correlate dosimetric parameters like DBH between mm -hmm. auto segmented, segmented contour and manual contours? Yes, so this one is part of the um, dosimetry assessment. So you can do this. You can do a, you can run, you can have a manual contour or uh, and then you have an auto contour as well. And you can mm -hmm. do a, you can do a dose calculation with, with all, all this with retrospective data. And you can see that, you know, your dice score might be very, very off, 80%, 70%. And you realize that your DVH might not be that off. So, I mean, it's, it's possible. So it's not, um, I think there are some studies done as well. Not not a lot, but there, there are certainly some studies done. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, But you mentioned a lot about retrospective, but isn't the use of AI for prospective use? That means able, like you say in some of the quotation, uh, having hmm. some predictive power. And uh, what do you think is the level of work required uh, from here to make AI more prospective, you know, in terms of uh, helping with the making decisions in the future hmm. for medical physics and for the clinical use? Yeah. So uh, a lot of things is retrospective in the sense that because a lot because AI, the way AI works as of now, I mean, the training process uses uh, retrospective data, and then the testing, the evaluation also uses kind of a, a retrospective data itself. So the training and the evaluation actually uses a lot of uh, um, uh, retrospective data. You can also do a prospective kind of testing. So there's uh, there are some work that do prospective testings. And uh, it also depends on the kind of application that we are looking at. If if it's auto auto segmentation, doing prospective kind of testing is very is very possible because it's not uh it's not uh very very interventional per se. So if let's say you are using AI to predict, for example, tumor response and all those drugs, then all these things will be very, very will be very very hard to push through. But AI for auto segmentation because there's always a part where a human will will come in and edit if it's not correct. So it's actually very possible to do a prospective study. So I think there's a there's a you know, JAMA, there's a JAMA paper by a physicist on the prospective um deployment of um of of uh, of auto segmentation software. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So uh another question is if if you know you pointed to the IAEA document of yes. the CQMP. Uh, in our responsibilities for AI, yeah. what what is your suggestion for anyone here in the audience who are new to AI? How do they start educating themselves on AI? Mm. So um, so now the barrier to entry to AI is actually not very high. So there are a lot of um online courses that we, um one can take either in school or in either in school or in, you know, online. And then you, from there, you can start and then you will scroll, go on with the standard stuff like supervised method, unsupervised method, and, and so on. So it's pretty, so um, there's quite a lot of well-established syllabus going on. So I think that's a very, very good place to start. Okay, good. I mean, there are probably a lot of online resources uh, that can be used as well, but we probably need to think about uh, something that is uh, uh, kind of accredited uh, kind of material that will help guide uh, our learning in a more systematic way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so here's another question. Uh, regarding, uh, let me see. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, in a study that uh, one of the audience conducted, the DSC and mm -hmm. other geometric metrics are coming in a good agreement. Uh, uh, and uh, this is about significant dosimetric differences observed between the columns. And uh, let me see whether I got it right. Uh, but, okay, so the geometric matrix is coming in good on the DSC, but significant dosimetric differences observed between the contours. What yeah. may be the possible reasons? 
So, I mean, I mean, there are several questions here. First of all, it's like, um, what do you mean a good agreement? Is the DSC uh, 80%, 90%? And then uh, also like significant or symmetry difference. Uh, what does significant mean? Statistically significant or do you mean um, dosimetrically significant because you know, when your data is very large, right, it's actually very easy to get statistically significant. Yeah. But the question is whether the effect size, I mean, it might be statistically significant, but end of the day, the dose actually are very, very, are not much different. So, yeah. I mean, uh, without close look at the data, right, it's actually very hard to, to okay. tell right away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's another question regarding the paper of towards optimal stopping in radiation therapy, could you tell us a little bit more about how you can use the idea of optimal stopping in RT or OSRT in ART? Okay, so um, there are a few ways that um, optimal stopping, uh, the, of, the idea of optimal stopping means that you change the dose fractionation on a personalized basis. Uh -huh. And there are a few ways to do it. So one way is, you do some kind of dosing at the start, like the trial. You do some dosing at the start, and you look at the you look at the multi omics data of the patients for the first few fraction. Then you adapt the dose. So, so it kind of um play it kind of a, it's a different definition of an ART per se. It's, it's you, you you adapt you adapt the dose to the uh bio, you get the most biological um to maximize the biological effectiveness per se. So that that's one way. So, uh, one thing that we and our clinician are doing now is, uh, this this idea has found some success in other fields. So, uh, we have this idea of you know we call the curate AI, where we give let's this there are positive trials and results in blood pressure and chemotherapy. Now. So yeah. we give three different dosing of the drugs to the patients. And we measure that certain biomarkers it can be uh for, for diabetes or this a blood sugar level or this thing on three different days. And using three different dose levels, you get a parabola. And we know that if we manage to get a parabola, we know that that's the optimal dose that we can give. So this trial has been run and found success in blood pressure and chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is ongoing. Yeah. And uh we recently just put forward uh paper or a kind of a conception paper on this in real therapy so yeah so that's so that's one way so three different dosing and if it's a fast responding tumor we might be able to see some but i mean uh, of course i mean there are there are other ways that we can do it like the the one that the paper that was presented they do a single dosing but they look at really multi omics data to, to decide what's the optimal fraction and adapt mm. the dose. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that um, the question was answered adequately. Uh, hey, there's uh, one last question probably for the day. Is the generative AI model has shown systematic deviations in HU values in, uh, in this case, in uh, the generated image? Any ideas to reduce the gap as in, in the deviation? And what are the acceptable deviations to input the generated image into the TPS. Hmm. So as of now, I think the metrics that we will be using is really a lot of if you have a reference. So the oh. idea is, so just now I attach a, um, the paper is a little ray station. So that paper is actually a, a good reference. So that, that's one way to assess um, whether your generated uh, CBC is actually good enough for use in clinic. If you have a reference, so let's say you have a VCC on that day, you have a VCC mm. on that day, and then you have a you have a CBC on the same day. Mm. Okay, then you can compare your generated, uh, your generated, your synthetic CT from the CBCT with the VCT results, and then mm. the gamma passing rate right will be your final gauge of whether how good your, whether how how good your generative AI model is. If you are getting like one percent one mm to be more than ninety five percent ninety percent, I think it's usable clinically. Hmm. Yeah, we are looking at dosimetric endpoints. Yeah, correct. Right. So actually, the question is asked: What's an acceptable deviation in order to input this kind of generated image into a TPS? Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Right. 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 Right.